Hello, welcome to PM Personality Profile. It's another Friday and we have a personality, this time in our studio, and we're going to talk to him about his life, his work, and everything else he wants to talk about. We won't put pressure on him unless he wants to say something. His name is Professor Kwame Kakari, who is a former executive director of the Media Foundation for West Africa and a former DG of the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. Welcome, Prof. Thank you very much. How is life growing up? How was life growing up <laughs> for you? For you? Mm, growing up? Yes. I suppose it was normal. I grew up in the 1950s, I mean, as a child, in 1960s, as a teenager, and then matured into adulthood in the 70s, 80s, and today. Uh, growing up as a child was a lot of fun, okay. I think. I, my parents are, were not wealthy people, mm -hmm. but I never felt that I was from a poor background. I mean, my father was a simple, middle lower public servant working in PWD. Mm -hmm. My mother, a simple village woman, a farmer, and then a trader selling petty things like most women do. And um, I think, you know, I had a good um, growing up as a child, I, I grew up in the village, my village Achim Erisa, yeah. near Achimoda in the eastern region. Okay. And um, I, I, when I look back, I think I enjoyed life as a youngster life growing up. Life was very up. simple then, I guess. Well, as a child, it looked simple or complicated in some ways, but you know, I, I went to a primary school which will be 100 years next year. Okay. And then a middle boarding school, an old Presbyterian middle boarding school. And all throughout the primary and middle schools, I, I think it was a lot of fun. It's very, very good memories. You know, mm. growing up as a child, going to farm, you know, escapading in the forest, trapping animals, you know, <laughs> Uh, uh, going to the riverside and, and trapping fish and so on and so forth, catching crabs <laughs> with your hand um, and so on and so forth. It was fun. It was, you know, uh, very good memories. Then, of course, the advantage or privilege of being very close to elders and therefore learning a lot about your culture, your mm -hmm. traditions, um, and, and the ethos and values of that society were all very good. Uh, it was um, an upbringing that I think uh, shaped all of us into citizens who uh, grew up upholding certain values okay. and upholding also certain, um, yeah, certain values and also uh, certain ambitions and um, also living in an era when uh, there was a lot of hope growing up. Because remember that I grew up when we got independence and the whole atmosphere was one of hope, one of, you know, uh, the, the, you know everything was possible. So you could dream as mm -hmm. a youngster. There was an atmosphere in which you could dream because really you cannot dream if you don't have hope. Yeah. You know, you can't dream. It's impossible to dream if you don't have hope. So um, I think the time I grew up was one of the really uh, golden moments in this country's history. And I'm glad I was born at the time and I grew up at the time that I grew up. Are you um, from a large family? family size? Well, let's, what you mean is my, my nuclear family, Your nuclear right? nuclear family. How many siblings? My, parents? We, we were seven. 
we, we were seven. My elder sister, I'm the second child, my elder sister who grew up and worked to become one of the nurses, nursing matrons okay. in Kolibu. She died a few years ago, almost 20 years ago now. And so we, the six of us have remained. We are three boys and four women. Fairly balanced. Uh, well, yes, fairly balanced. But, you know, as Africans, Ghanaians, narrowing down to Akans, and for that matter, every ethnic group, the family is larger than the nuclear family. Yes. I come from a clan, if we put it that way, which was large. I grew up in the, the house of my great-grand, great-great-grand uncle. Okay. I came to see him. Uh, the house had two sections. Mm -hmm. It still does have two sections. I think that house was built perhaps more than 120 years ago, but we pulled it down and rebuilt it. It still has the two sections. One section was for the women, and the other section was for the men. The women's section was where the kitchen was, where the, the cooking and everything was done, and so where, as young kids, you spent most of your time with your mothers because of the chores of the house, fetching water, uh, cleaning, this and that. And that clan was huge because the house I'm talking about had uh, 18 rooms. Uh, my uncles, that's my mother's siblings and my mother's what we may call cousins and so on. We all lived in this huge uh, uh, compound house. Yes, society on its own. Just yes. the clan. Yes, and because my my great-great-grand uncle and my grand uncles and my uncles were, in terms of the village, respected members of the society. Mm -hmm. Our house was always full of people. Mm -hmm. In the evenings, for instance, people trooped through the house a lot. Some were coming to settle matters. They came to my grand uncles to resolve issues, family matters, uh, property matters, and so on and so forth. And, and some of us were lucky because our grand uncles, our great grand uncle would call us to come around and serve them. Bring me water, bring me this and that. So we were able to, yes, uh, listen to what was going on and learn a few things as well as learn the language that uh, our mother tongue, you know, properly. So, um, uh, it was a way in which you mix with the elders, okay. learned the norms of the society, the values of the society, uh, heard stories, heard rumors, heard all kinds of things that were, were going on in the larger you know, village community and in the district and so on and so forth. So obviously that shaped you to who you are, but growing up you had your own dreams. Um, what were your dreams growing up? Growing up, to I went to, as I said, I went to a Presbyterian school. So um, as a child, uh, perhaps I wanted to be, at some point, I wanted to be a doctor. At some point, I wanted to be an accountant. I didn't know what an accountant was, <laughs> so but was I heard the name. No, okay. I, I, I heard the name, I think, somehow in school. <laughs> Uh, one teacher may have been mentioning professions. Okay. So the name accountant stuck. Yeah. And I was good at arithmetic okay. at the time. So I thought I would one day be an accountant. But then um, uh, another time I thought I would be um, what a bus driver because I visited my <laughs> father in Kumasi. And in those days the <laughs> municipal bus system were there. So I, I saw how neatly they were dressed okay. and how they were conducting their affairs, the conductor and so on. And I thought I would be a bus driver when I grew up. But then uh, at some point, I thought I would be a journalist also. That is something that uh, stuck very much in my, in my mind, that I would be, I wanted to become a journalist because my great-grand-uncle, would buy a newspaper, and I remember from class four, mm -hmm. 
he would ask me, because I was good in school, they would always ask me to read the telegrams, the letters, and the newspaper to them. And I had one aunt, my father's sister, Aminyakwa, who would also buy the newspaper and from her house sent for me to read it to him. She had a, a, a son who became one of the, I think, members of the Legislative Assembly, Yabusumpim, who was writing into the newspapers. And that mm -hmm. attracted me a lot. You know, so um, from way back, these were some of the things I thought I would want to become. Um, I didn't know I would end up being a teacher. That came later. It wasn't by choice, but I, I believe that perhaps it's the best thing that happened to my life. You think you're a born teacher? Or I don't know that. Along I'm, the line? I'm born a teacher. I don't know that, but I, it is something, as I said, that initially wasn't part of my dreams. But then when I went into it, mm -hmm. uh, I can tell myself now that I wouldn't exchange that for any other experience. Uh, I've been a journalist, I've done work with media, I've done all kinds of different things, but um, I, I don't think there's anything I would cherish more than being a teacher. But as a journalist, you were already imparting knowledge, reporting what yeah. others were saying, but yes. teaching presented a whole different opportunity for you to impart knowledge directly into people. Whilst doing that, did you face challenges? How did it go for you? You see, for me, teaching, why I say it is perhaps one of the professions I wouldn't exchange for anything, and I would almost always recommend it for any serious-minded young person, is the joy of working with human beings all the time. The joy of working with young people. I've taught in a primary school, mm -hmm. I've taught in a secondary school, and I've taught in a university. And in each case, in the primary school, you, you have a responsibility with minds that are now forming. Okay. I taught at some point in class one, and then in class six in primary school. And these are youngsters who look up to you more than they look up even That's to their true. parents. I agree. You see, and, and the joy of it is that if you are going to be a good teacher, though it that may not come consciously to you every day, every day, your encounter makes you always ask yourself, am I doing the right thing? Yes. It imposes on you some discipline. One, patience, tolerance, and a, a good capacity to listen to human beings, to people. Um, and also, I think uh, one of the very important um, elements of being a teacher is humility. You see, you are working with children who have dreams of their own, who have ambitions, who need love all the time, who need an environment in which they can grow, whichever way that they, they, their future is, they can grow into this or that. So you always have to ask yourself, am I doing the right thing? Um, because children are always asking you questions, teacher, yes. this yes. and that. Yes. They expect you to know all. They expect you to know everything. Mm -hmm. And once people expect you to know all, I think that's the beginning of the importance of becoming humble. You see, because first you can't know everything. You can only know so much. And yet when people want you to know, it, dem it, de it demands from you the humility of saying no, I don't know, when you don't know. And also it demands on you the honesty and the patience and the tolerance of explaining things to people. And of course, the biggest challenge in teaching is how to explain things to people to understand. That's Not your important. opinion, but to understand an objective reality of what, you know, whatever is about. So 
A teacher also learns to remove yourself from what you are trying to teach. Because it's not you you are teaching. Mm -hmm. It's some wisdom, some lesson, some science, history, whatever. It's not you. It's not your opinion. You may bring your opinion in, but you can only express an opinion when you understand what is. Yes. You know, so, uh, and at the secondary school level, you are, you are dealing with teenagers. Who are inquisitive. People too. inquisitive uh, who are unstable in their formation, who are exploring, who also have so many questions. And therefore, who want to be adults, and because they want to be adults, challenge you, the adult, in so many ways. So many teachers, so many headmasters, headmistresses, see many of these things as bad boy, bad girl. No, I've never seen young people as bad boys, bad girls. Of course, there are always certain behaviors that cannot be tolerated. But even when you notice them as a teacher, you find ways of teaching these youngsters to move away from those practices. For instance, stealing yes. or lying. Uh, I never in my teaching career ever, ever liked caning students. Okay. It's abhorrent to me. Hmm. It's, um, it's so barbaric, you know, that I, I think we should ban it from our school system. But he spared the rot, he spoiled the child. Well, That's whoever wrote that in the Bible it. was writing it uh, some 4,000 years ago. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sparing the rot, you know, figurative, it could be figurative. Yes. You have to scold the child. When, you see, young people do not like humiliation. Mm. Young people don't like to be disgraced. Young people don't want to be found to be... Uh, less equal to their peers. their peers. So when you know that, that psychological state of young people, there are many different kinds of punishment you can give to young people to reform without having to torture them with a cane. That's so caning so, is torture for It's you. torture. It's so brutish. Pain on the human being. Somebody who has come to the classroom to learn. Somebody who has come to the boarding school to be nurtured, to be brought up into a, a good citizen. And you are, you are, you are inculcating pain. in them pain, and therefore hatred, anger, and everything that a human being shouldn't be encouraged to have in their, in their makeup. So, um, but there are many ways of punishing young people. So that through the punishment, they learn. And they come to respect you. They come to respect you. The punishment must not be inhumane, you see. Uh, because if we don't even allow these... I, I learned that even in prison, you know, capital punishment, you have to go through so many regulations to cane a prisoner, for instance. Why should we allow that in a classroom? Where young... And you see teachers beating up... A five-year-old child, class one. What, what kind of life is that? Um, so um, teaching is love for me. Mm. It's love. It's, if you don't love the human beings you are going to work with, that's not your business. At the university level, too, these are adults who are coming to the university to acquire higher knowledge. Higher knowledge yes. Some are al already employed. Some are in some very high positions wherever they work. Parents. Some are parents. Some are young people who are continuing their education mm -hmm. to become uh, what you call it, professionals of whatever. Whatever it is, they are all adults. And if they are adults, you must respect them as you respect any adult, as you respect yourself. Uh, a student in your classroom could be your younger brother or your senior brother or your father or uncle or somebody of your wife's age or um, your sister or whatever. Nowadays, you even find somebody who could be a lecturer's mother sitting in front of him. 
So you must respect those people. But that's not how it is for many teachers. You know, we, we are different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the journalist, the journalist in you, the journalist that um, you became. How was it um, practicing as a journalist? Um, to start with, my actual professional journalistic practice was not very long. Uh, in terms of freelancing, in terms of... When did uh, you start? Well, I, the first, I started writing for newspapers. I started as a newspaper journalist, and that's the journalism I know. Okay. As far as broadcasting goes, my knowledge is only about the management of broadcasting, mm -hmm. not the practice of radio or TV. I've never done that. My experience in journalism, mainly print journalism. Uh, I started my very first articles. Mm. I started writing them when I was teaching at Navrongo Secondary School. Mm. And I was writing some articles for what? No, let me backtrack. <laughs> my very first articles were some contributions to the graphic. When I was... I had just come out from training college and um, then I also started writing to the old uh, famous Legon Observer. Mm. And then when I went to teach in uh, secondary school, Navrongo Secondary School, I started writing a little bit more regularly, okay. occasionally to uh, a famous newspaper but which is now a ghost of itself. <laughs> the pioneer of Kumasi. Okay. Uh, heard, the the pioneer. The yes, the pioneer is one of the old newspapers, mm. founded in 1937, mm -hmm. and played quite a role in this country's anti-colonial mm. struggle and also in its own opposition to different governments. But now it's a ghost of itself. I don't even know uh, how many copies they print nowadays in Kumasi. Then. Uh, when I went to study in the United States, that's when I did all the newspaper journalism that I, I have as an experience. I, I did a lot of... It. You see, in the United States, it's easy to become a journalist because sec uh, high schools, campuses, every university campus has newspapers, yes. radio stations. So it's easy if you have the interest to, to start from to there. Start from there. Okay. And I worked with, for the four years, undergraduate four years that I was uh, in the United, my undergraduate at the United States, I worked on a campus newspaper called The Paper. The paper. It belonged to the black and African students, you know, in the, on the campus. And I worked with it. And then uh, from there, I went to work with another news. This was, was not a campus newspaper, but a, a commercial newspaper, what, what we may call a leftist newspaper, politically leftist, socialist, and all of that, uh, called The Guardian Weekly. The Guardian Weekly folded. That's a stopped publication in 1996, I think. But I worked with The Guardian newspaper from even when I was a student uh, undergraduate, throughout when I was doing my master's degree until, and then when I finished, I worked with them full time until I came back to this country in 1970. Now together, I must have worked for that newspaper for seven uh, years. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Prof, we'll, we'll, we'll come back. We'll, we'll take a short break and then we'll come back. We still have Professor Kwame Kakar, who is, who is a former executive director of the Media Foundation for West Africa, and then we'll talk more on personality profile. Welcome back. We've been talking to Professor Kwame Kaka, who is a former executive director of the Media Foundation for West Africa and a founder too and he has just retired from the University of Ghana after 36 years of service to the Premier University. Prof, how was your time at the state broadcaster, GBC, at the management level? 
How easy was it? <laughs> difficult? Uh, well, it was easy, it was difficult, it was complicated, uh, in some ways dangerous. Okay. Um, I was appointed by the PNDC, headed by uh, former chairman, former president Jerry John Rawlings, as director general of the GBC in April 1982, mm. in the heat of what was then called a revolution. Mm. Uh, and I served until uh, for two years, until 1984. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it is one of the most exciting and rewarding experiences I have had. First of all, if you work during a military regime, and a military regime of the, uh, of the PNDC that was proposing a revolution, it was a very convulsive period in this country's uh, uh, history. It was a period where the masses of the people thought that they could change this society, you know, and turn it um, around. Um, it was a time of a lot of promise also for liberation, for, you know, changing things. It was a time when uh, there was a proposition for very high moral uh, values and standards, anti-corruption, anti-this and that. Uh, in my estimation, none of these values, none of these ideals uh, were realized. Nothing was realized in my estimation. None of the ideals, hmm. neither the, perhaps the most important achievement under the PNDC was arresting um, a dependent economy mm -hmm. that was so rotten, so ground down, that young people today don't have an idea how it was living around from about 1977 to about 1985. Mm. You have no idea. There was nothing like toothpaste to get on the market. There was nothing in the shops. I mean, transport, for instance. Uh, it was difficult to have transport because there was no money to import fuel, this and that. And I think the PND did well in arresting this bankrupt economy. Uh, but then, by arresting it, it also set the country onto a recovery that, in my estimation, has made us even more dependent hmm. on foreign economies and so on. But now coming to the, uh, Your time. the GBC. Yes. Because you needed to put all these things out, communication exactly. out in such a difficult moment Very as you difficult call it. Moment. So how but did you manage that? You see... When I went to GBC in 1982, there was only one studio camera. There was TV. There was only one working studio camera, which had tapes all over. It was broken down, but the guys were doing the best they could. The studios were all in decrepit conditions. Everything was breaking down just as the whole country had ground to its knees. So it was very difficult. That was the only broadcasting organization in the country. This is a military regime. And first of all, they announced the coup d'etat at this radio station, which establishes the fact that this is our instrument for uh, speaking to the people. So it was the, the, the thing about under a military regime, the national broadcaster being the mouthpiece of the military regime should not be in any doubt at all. It would be used any time the, the, the military head, the head of the junta wanted, and so on and so forth. It was a one-way communication with the people. 
uh, under the circumstances, you know, public opinion was was nowhere to be found. Mm. It wasn't a situation where now everybody can express themselves about what government is doing and so on and so forth. Uh, it was the government speaks and everybody listens, whether you liked it or not. Okay. Of course, that's not the first time this country had uh, experienced, a experienced something like that. Um, so the difficulty was the arbitrariness with which all kinds of people in the government was w wanted to use broadcasting. You so see, you are the director the general, and sometimes some officer or even a non-commissioned officer walks into the studio thinking that it, belong, it belongs to them, mm -hmm. you know, and to get whatever they want to get onto the air spoken. So, um, you see, lately, when I had made comments that the NDC, that was not very palatable to the NDC government, NDC propagandists, okay. who should know better, have attacked me, you know, accusing me of uh, that my, I destroyed broadcasting. That's what they say. Did you? Well, I think it's the elders in the NDC who were then there at the time, who have nothing else to say against me, who would say, because you and I, you and many people don't know what went on, so they throw this about as propaganda to thinking that it would sully my name and so on. But before I left, I had worked very hard to get a grant from, not alone, a grant mm -hmm. from the Japan government mm -hmm. to re rehabilitate GBC. And that was the first time that we got a color television. Okay. I had made all the arrangements, but I was thrown out before it was inaugurated. Um, so, but some of the difficulties at GBC mm -hmm were more with dealing with the arbitrariness of a military regime. Did you, did you regret taking up that appointment? No, I have never regretted. I've oh, never you didn't know where you were, what, what you were up against? You got there and you were met with this yes, arbitrariness? Yes, I didn't know. I didn't know, you know, broadcasting. I was a young lecturer. I didn't know what broadcasting was. As I told you, my mm -hmm. only experience in journalism had been with uh, the print. print. And so, of course, I've been into GBC studios to do one or two programs before, but it's not the same as coming and mm -hmm. confronted with the, 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 the reality of... Let, and GBC at the time was a huge, one of the biggest organizations in this country. It had a, a radio station, I mean, a satellite radio stations. You know, in those days, uh, radio... Local radio was broadcast through cables, okay. you know. So there was a radio station, a GBC local station in nearly every district in this country. And so it was a huge organization with about a staff of nearly 5,000 in At those time, days. And wow. far flung everywhere in this country with... Um, That's huge. A huge organization. Um, and again, it was the only broadcasting organization. So the pressures on it from the society for... Ev look at today's media landscape. And even look at how everybody, every politician, every institution, every church, every mosque, every this, every that, want their news in the, in the media. And imagine how that was for one national radio station. And imagine how that demand from the larger public was competing with the permanent demands of the military regime to always be in the in the air in the news mm. you know um military leaders and it's not only rawlings but military leaders all over crave media attention more than any kind of politician <laughs> Precis why do they do that precisely because they they have no no constituency okay. but the military with which they came to power so they need the media for their legitimacy and also for the people to know them and to see them so they crave for the broadcasting house 
you know, very, very, uh, in a very, uh, how do you call it, uh, very, very much more than anything else. It's the first thing they worry about because that's also the thing that any coup maker will use. Will use to get to the people. To get to the people. Mm. But the good thing about GBC, I must say, is that the staff there were professional. The engineers were professional. The newsroom people were professional. Uh, the staff in all the de departments, highly experienced, highly trained professionals. So sometimes, I was a young person, sometimes these highly experienced broadcasters, I remember really some names of some of these elderly people that I bow to whenever I, you know, reflect on them, Mr. Usu Prempe and people like that. I mean, really patriots who have served this country so well uh, and diligently and with all their love for, for the profession. They would tell you that, DG, don't worry, we'll do it. We've done it all the time, so we'll do it. When there was something critical to be done, for instance, you know, broadcasts of national events and so on. So that helped a lot. But you see, that could only help if you, the outsider who have come in, works closely with them, gains their confidence and trust. And that's what I think I try to do very well. First, respecting the people who were there already and not coming in and thinking that Imposing because the revolution has brought you mm -hmm. there, you are there to try. And people will always resist that in so many ways. Yes. But I found uh, the cooperation of all these stuff from the, the receptionists at the gate to the directors of radio, TV, engineering, whatever. It was a wonderful experience for me. Okay. Um, and so some of the difficulties were, you know, were, were made less so difficult. But the dangerous moments were uh, moments when there were coup attempts. I remember that one of these attempted coups, I was there. It started around about, I think it started around about 5 p.m. And um, I got a call from Rollins to stay there. <laughs> so I told myself, to stay there for what? <laughs> I'm not a soldier. <laughs> In any case, I couldn't go out because the, the people who were attacking GBC were outside. Okay. So the staff who hadn't gone home yet were all inside the house. You know, Rollins said, stay there. Uh, the late um, MPP Minister of Health, uh, what was his name? Um, oh, he was a, a senior military officer from the PNDC. Courage, there. Kwashiga. Kwashiga, yes. Kwashiga was commanding the, the, the government forces at the time. But the short of it is that Rollins called me and said, stay there. It took me three days, and some of the st staff, three days before we could get out. Okay. You know. And was that for your safety? Well, whatever it is, you whatever it is, what it I don't was. know, but I think Rollins knew that they could get rid of those people, but he also did, thought that staying there meant that there would be, you know, the staff would would control you know the broadcasting facilities mm. we know what to do when so just come into the gbc they don't know mm. where to go yes you know so if we are there we will secure mm. those places with the loyalist soldiers around so that's why he probably said stay there but also for my safety because he probably thought that if you go out that's where the shooting is coming from and mm. you could be killed so um as i said took us three days didn't wash you know, uh, it was the soldiers, the food that the soldiers, or their ration mm. that we shared with them, those staff that were there. Because, you know, we couldn't go out, so we couldn't eat, and so on. Um, it happened about two or three times whilst I was there. And you didn't and see the need to abandon your post? 
Because no, these I was, things will get you worried all the time that it can happen again and again and again. First of all, a government and the head of that government had appointed me to this responsibility. I was not opposed to that government, nor was I opposed to the, the, the leader of that revolution. And if I am a responsible person, I can't abandon my responsibility. So I didn't question, you know, the dangers. In any case, I mean, really, if you say you are in a revolution, there, there could be dangers all the time anyway. But primarily, I, I, had to, I had to exhibit my commitment to, to the organization I've been appointed to head. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, there was no question. If I, I didn't want that position, mm -hmm. then it meant, as I did eventually, it meant uh, going against or going in opposition or in, yeah, opposition to, to that government and so on. So I, 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 I So you I don't, don't regret find... any decision you took around no, no, that no, time? No, 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 I don't no regret, regret anything. In fact, it's enriched me. All these around. experiences, you know, I mean, it, you can't buy them. <laughs> you, you only have to experience them to talk about them. You have to experience them, them yeah. to talk about them. And it, it helps build you yourself mm. as a person and in your, your relationships with people and your role in society, you know, so... It was okay. Uh, yeah. But you're seen as a proponent of media freedom. Do, do, do you see yourself as such? A proponent of media freedom? Yes, yes, yes. And you some, see? Okay, you go no, ahead. Go on, go on, ask some, question. Some, I, I was reading about you, mm. and then I saw some decisions you made mm. um, around the 1982, between 1982 in 1984, mm -hmm. that you recommended mm. or you saw to it that some two newspapers, the Catholic Standard and one other newspaper, were stopped operating, actually. Stop Even stopped operating. operating. They stopped operations because you recommended. Is that true? I, I, I found it very difficult to believe. So I've I, never heard this. Yes, I, I saw that. It's very strange. Is there any way someone would think you saw to wait that the Catholic Standard and then the other newspaper? Because you're seen as someone who champions the cause for media freedom. I've never so heard why? this story. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the people who publish the Catholic Standard are still there. They're, they're, they are yes, senior I know, Catholic yes. people and anybody can ask them if this And Ashanti the Pioneer. Well, um, that's what I'm saying, Pioneer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very strange to me. I've never ever heard this kind of thing. Very strange to me. First of all, when I was serving the PNDC, I was serving as Director General of GBC. GBC. So I had no power over any, any other, other media. Any other, by the GBC. But even GBC, <laughs> I didn't have, a, have You're power just a to say this or that. Uh, so it's strange to me for anybody to say anywhere that I got those papers banned. Yes. It's very strange to me because I don't know, you know. You banned them from the editorial review of GBC. Oh, from So that the, they will not, yes. They, they, they don't come to the limelight. From because the newspaper obviously, review yes, program. Obviously, they were the main, the GBC was the main channel. That Therefore, they had newspaper reviews. Mm -hmm. But even that, I don't know that that's how it's done. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that's how it's done because, you see, <laughs> in those days, and being in GBC and being vocal, all manner of things will be put on your head. Mm. I will never stand anywhere and, and say that I wasn't responsible for what happened in GBC okay. during my time. I may be able to explain this or that. But you see, for instance, when I got there, remember that there were all kinds of forces at play at that time. We had the workers' defense committees all over who had got so many senior uh, GBC people, some engineer, wonderful engineers and so, dismissed by the PNDC for various reasons that I don't even know. 
And you see, people would say that I got them dismissed. Yes. I can I can only keep quiet. Because okay. on what basis would I dismiss any worker when I, I, I have just got into the organization and I don't know what the people do? Mm. You know, so uh, some of these things also are said about people who served that government because they don't like that government. I mean, let's face it, the PNDC was one of, most, one of the most repressive governments this country has seen. So it courted a lot of enemies among so many sections of the society. At the same time as it courted a lot of passion and, and support from the mass sections of this society, there were many enemies of the, of the PNDC. People hated the PNDC. People hated Rawlings. People hated all the people who had served in any positions mm -hmm. under that government. So many things can be said okay. about you that may not have substance. But like but you said, you'd rather keep quiet. Well, if I can explain it, I would. But if I don't know about it, what else can I do? To keep quiet. Yeah. Prof, we'll take another break here. We still have Professor Kwame Kakar, who is a former executive director of the Media Foundation for West Africa, and he has just retired after 36 years of service to the University of Ghana School of Communication Studies. We'll be back. Welcome back, Professor Kwame Kakari is still here with me on PM Personality Profile. Prof, are you a controversial person? Controversy? <laughs> I don't think so. What am I controversial about or what about me should be controversial? I, no, I'm not. But you have strong opinions about, um, about issues. Of yeah. course, I have very strong opinions about so many things, yes. But that shouldn't make me controversial or, no, I, I don't know. I, Are you a politician? No, 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 no. But I'm a, a, a strong political animal. I've been a strong political activist, but I'm not a politician if a politician means somebody who is doing politics in order to get into state power then I'm not I don't belong to any political party I vote as a, 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 citizen? a citizen but I don't belong to any party I've, I've never registered for any party I've never stood for any election and I, I'm not sure I'm going to uh, seek political office of any sort. Are you a religious person? I'm not a religious, I'm not a very religious person. I believe in God, but I'm not a practicing anything. Uh, I was born into Christianity, but I don't know, I don't, I'm not a very strong So are you a Pan-Africanist? Oh yes, yes, for Pan-Africanist, my, my heart and mind and, and being. Because who would who, who doesn't want Africa to be free? Look at us here in Ghana, or Nigeria, or elsewhere. We want our society to be such that we live a happier life than this. Mm -hmm. We live a more rewarding, a more uplifted life than what the average African's life is now. The humiliation that Africans have gone through and still go through uh, are not something that any particularly any educated African should take for granted. Our people have suffered, we still suffer. Look at around the world now. Who suffer more than Africans or people of African descent? Look at the, the thousands of people who are perishing trying to cross the Mediterranean for greener pastures. Why should that be? Uh, look at the kinds of governance systems we have. Africa is the richest we have. Uh, but look at our own country, Ghana. It's such an example of the morass that Africa is in now. What don't we have in this country? But look at us. Even clothing, we depend on other people's rags. It's not right. Well, it's, it's not right. Okay, are, are you a sports 
person? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, Favorite game? Football, of course. I Have you played to before? Watch, yeah, a bit, but not to any, you know, any level of uh, to worth talking about. Okay. But I travel to watch the, the Black Stars, you know, uh, even outside of this country when I have the money. And wherever they are playing in Ghana, I go and watch them. Tamale, Kumasi, whatever. Prof, in wrapping up, if, you, if I'm cooking dinner for you and I yeah. ask you to invite six fantasy guests, who will make it to your list? Who will make fantasy guests? Yes. Six. Six. One, my wife. Yeah. You say six. Yes. <laughs> One. They can be from anywhere around the world. One, my wife. Mm -hmm. One, my closest friend mm. who is from Eritrea mm -hmm. but lives in the United States. He's a publisher of uh, the Africa World Press books in New Jersey. Then the four others would be my very close friends, Akutu Ampao, the lawyer, okay. who is really my brother, uh, Nana Mo Adadibuama. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, mm. and then uh, the fourth <laughs> person this is difficult <laughs> <laughs> this is difficult is fun, is and then fun my good you. friend and old classmate you have friends Mr. Uwa Mensa mm. an, oh, a, a retired banker mm. this would be the six people to my my what do you call it the, the dinner and I, I, I take your uh, your okay. word for it <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much Pro, but before we go final one give me one value you will not live without value. one value I will not live without yes. speaking the truth always yes it's you know it's thank no you compromise very much. on that thank you very much Professor Kwame Karaka he has been our guest on PM personality, and it's been fun hanging out with him. My name is Martha Krenzelakwa. Thank you for watching.